All right, why don't we start with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and thanks for your goodness, for creating us, for calling us to yourself in holiness. Lord, we ask your blessing upon each of us tonight. Help us to be open to your truth, to follow where you lead, and to have great joy, knowing that you want us to have your life and have it to the full, knowing that you want to give us your joy, that ours might be complete. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Great. It's always great to be back in Aggie land. Yeah. This evening, we're going to be talking about contraception, and I want to go ahead and just uh, get the elephant, uh, call out the elephant in the room. What can a celibate man uh, teach us about contraception? All right? So let me begin by stating one presumption that I have about sex, all right? I presume it's one of the most thrilling and pleasurable activities that you can do on earth, all right? Celibacy hasn't given me any other impression, all right? Now let me, <laughs> let me state one presumption that you can have about me, okay? I'm not interested in diminishing that experience, all right? So you can breathe a sigh of relief. All right. God made sex, and his first command to man and woman was to have it. Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now, God could have made it as boring as a handshake, but he chose to make it one of the most thrilling and pleasurable activities on earth, and I'm not here to diminish what he created. All right. Now, actually, as a celibate man, I think that I can admire what he created in some ways with an even deeper appreciation, because right? the sacrifice is only as good as the gift that is offered up. Right? I have a deep appreciation of the gift that I have offered, and I have no intention whatsoever of diminishing the value of my sacrifice, all right? So I actually intend to do the very opposite. I want to defend the value and the goodness of sex. I'm not interested in people and keeping people from going too far. I actually want to show how contraception keeps people from going far enough, all right? It's contraception that diminishes the experience of sex. And I don't want you to settle for anything less than what God has created. So my favorite scripture passage, some of you who were here when I was an associate pastor could probably recite it. It's John 10, 10. I came that they might have life and have it to the full. And it's echoed in John 15. I have told you this so that my joy might be in you and your joy might be complete. So his desire for our good is what motivated every single word that he spoke, every single miracle that he worked, and every single drop of blood that he shed. And his teachings on sexuality are not somehow apart from his desire for us, right? His desire that we might have life to the full and joy and completion, they serve that very purpose. His teachings on sexuality serve the purpose of giving us life to the full and joy and completion. They free us and empower us from settling from the cheap thrills and allow us to know true joy. Now, the question tonight is going to be, what does that look like in the area of sex? And that's what we're going to be speaking about this evening. So let's get started. Here's the outline of the talk. I'm going to have more or less two parts with a third part as a kind of conclusion. All right. So the first part is going to be more philosophical in nature. Uh, we're going to be discussing the meaningfulness of sex. Why is it different from a handshake, for example? And then we're going to see how contraception measures up to that meaning. Now, the second part of the talk is going to be more observational in nature. We're going to look at how the pill works and its consequences on women. And then finally, the last part, we're going to conclude by discussing fertility awareness-based methods of family planning, FABMs. Right? In Catholic circles, you may know this as natural family planning, or NFP. They're two different names for the same thing. I'm going to probably say both throughout the presentation. 
throughout the presentation, FABM, Fertility Awareness Based Models. This is known in the medical community. Uh, and actually, this is why I have wanted to do this presentation in the first place. Father Chris mentioned that I studied uh, bioethics specifically when I was in seminary, and I have a soft place in my heart, especially for medical professionals. So if you are a medical professional or studying to be one, I would love to meet you afterwards and be able to talk about uh, all the wonderful advances that our Catholic faith has allowed specifically for women's health, but healthcare in general. And I'm going to speak about that towards the end of the talk, all right? So there you have it, outline of the talk, philosophical in nature, then more observational, and then we're gonna be talking about these fertility awareness-based methods, all right? So let's begin with the meaningfulness of sex. Why don't cannibals eat clowns? They taste funny. All right. I know, I know it's pretty terrible. All right. I thought that dad jokes would be a good way to lighten up the presentation. Uh, it's especially helpful. There we go. Yeah, y'all like it as well. That's good. There's going to be a lot more. All right. What is the, what is the essence of a dad joke, right? It plays on a double meaning of one of the words in the joke. What do sprinters eat before a race? Nothing, they fast. <laughs> All right, so you have, to know, you have to know both meanings of the word in order to enjoy the joke or in order to cringe at the joke, whichever one you want. But that provides the segue for this section. What is the meaning of sex? So the first thing to admit is that sex is meaningful. It's not casual, even in the hookup culture. There's all kinds of laws and norms surrounding sex, which reveal that we hold it to be anything but casual. Here are three examples, all right? We allow children to consent to ice cream and refuse consent to broccoli, but our laws rightly reflect that they are not mature enough to consent or refuse consent to sexual activity. All right, here's another example. We're perfectly content for siblings and cousins to enjoy deep friendships, but our norms discourage sexual activity among close family members, even when there's no chance of a baby being conceived. All right, final example. We expect sex to happen in private, not in public, and we even have laws against public displays of affection. So why would these norms and laws exist if sex were as casual as a high five? All right. All right. Having admitted then that sex is meaningful, we can move to ask why. Why is sex meaningful? Why does it matter? Now, one theory would be that it's connected to the propagation of the species. Without new generations of children, older generations would lack the necessary support and the nation would collapse. Now, while I admit that sex is critical for the propagation of the species and that the propagation of the species is important, such a reason does not account for all of the norms and the laws that we have surrounding sex. For example, someone could propagate the species while they are still a minor, right? So that's not a sufficient reason. Another theory would be that it feels really, really good. Again, I don't deny that. But there are a lot of things that feel really, really good. Eating, drinking, exercising, achieving, all these things feel good. I want to get at the heart at why sex matters. What makes sex different from chocolate cake, margaritas, rock climbing, and making an A on a group project? It'd be a pretty awesome day, right? <laughs> um, okay. Uh, now, I think that the answer is a lot closer to heart than we might imagine. It's a lot less complicated than we could make it, all right? Sex matters because of its connection to romantic love, all right? In fact, sex is so closely tied to romantic love that if two individuals were not pursuing sexual union, no matter how many other things they might pursue together, we would say they don't share romantic love. Friends enjoy deep, emotionally intimate conversations. Siblings live in the same house. Co-workers strive for a common goal. But none of those characteristics, as important as they are, constitute romantic love. Even though romantic love can and should include all of those things, right? So anything this closely tied to love is bound to be meaningful. 
Love is what makes anything meaningful. It's why anything matters. I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say that war, government, and universities matter. And a quick reflection will show that all three of those things are connected to love. Wars protect those that you love. Governments order communities of people so that they can love, and universities enable students to pursue what they love, be it a job or the truth. Heck, even high fives matter insofar as they're connected to love, right? So, if sex is so connected to romantic love, such that if two people aren't pursuing it, they're not pursuing romantic love, then it is bound to be meaningful. And it behooves us to know what sex means, all right? Let's take a look at what it actually means. All kinds of love that we could experience. Romantic love is just one of them. There's the love of parents, the love of children, the love of siblings, friends, and coworkers, just to name a few others. But what distinguishes romantic love is not that it consists in appreciating the other or willing their good or desiring union with them. Those are common in all loves. What distinguishes romantic love is the type of union that is sought. Romantic love seeks a sexual union, and scripture has captured the meaning of this union in a way that has captivated the world throughout history. Genesis 2, 24. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. Friends can share deep emotional intimacy. Co-workers and teammates can strive for a common goal. And all of those are beautiful expressions of love. The friend appreciates her friend, wills her good, and wants union with her. Just because it's not a sexual union that she wants doesn't mean that it's not deep. Doesn't mean that it's shallow. Think of your best friend. When she hurts, don't you hurt as well? When she rejoices, don't you rejoice as well? Right? I'm united with my arm. If you hurt my arm, I will hurt. In a similar way, if you hurt my friend, I will hurt. The union of love does not have to be sexual. And it's even possible that the union of friendship is even more meaningful than sexual union which can be as shallow as a business transaction. 1 Corinthians 6.16 6, Do you not know that anyone who joins himself to a prostitute becomes one body with her? Right? Still, even though sexual union can be degraded to a business transaction, does not change the fact that romantic lovers seek to become one flesh. If they wanted to pursue a union of mind and heart, that would be friendship and a beautiful pursuit, but it would not be romantic love. Romantic love is constituted by sexual union, and that is a beautiful thing. So beautiful, in fact, that God chose that image to be an image of his love for us. Hosea 2, 15 and following. And in that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my ball. And I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. Romantic lovers seek to become one flesh, one body. What is it about sexual union that causes man and woman to be one flesh, one body, right? It's not merely bodily contact, right? We don't become one flesh with someone through a high five, a handshake, or even a wet willy, right? It's not merely the contact of sexual organs either, right? Gynecologists don't enter into one flesh unions with their patients. And it's not even enough that the sexual organs of both parties are stimulated, which can happen in something like mutual masturbation. No, romantic lovers want more than that. They want to become parts of one another. One flesh, one body. Becoming a fleshy part of the other so as to constitute one body happens when a man and a woman coordinate the use of their sexual organs in striving for reproduction. At that point, they're not merely united like co-workers are or teammates are through the pursuit of a common goal. No, it's more like the way that 
The heart and the lungs are coordinated in striving for oxygenation. They are one flesh, essential parts of one body. Now notice that this union occurs regardless of the personal intentions of the man and the woman. Even if they are intentionally pursuing only pleasure, their sexual intercourse causes a union of one body united in striving for reproduction. Right? In a similar way, someone might eat ice cream only for the taste, but the nourishment it provides is going to happen regardless of the personal intention. Union in one flesh is constitutive of romantic love. But let me reiterate, that doesn't mean that romantic love is limited only to the pursuit of reproduction. It can and it should include deep emotional intimacy too. But romantic love is distinguished from all the other loves because they pursue that one flesh union. The pursuit of reproduction brings about this one flesh union in a way that nothing else does. And that's what romantic lovers seek. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and clings to his wife, and the two of them become one body. All right, so that's the end of our philosophical part of the presentation. So let's make a summary, okay? Sex is meaningful. It matters because of its connection to romantic love, and while it can be used for other reasons, sex consummates romantic love because romantic love is distinguished by a desire to become one flesh. Sex makes man and woman fleshy parts of one body seeking reproduction. So, what does a couple do when they want to have sex, but they don't want to have a baby? All right, let's talk about contraception. Why did the raisin go out with the prune? Because he couldn't find a date. All right, I'm sorry. You're gonna to have to suffer through a lot more of these, okay? Fruits are a good segue to talk about the desire not to bear fruit, all right? <laughs> the desire to have sex without having children is as old as the Old Testament, all right? Genesis 38, we hear of Onan engaging in coitus interruptus, or also known as withdrawal. His brother had passed away before he had any children, and his father instructed Onan to take his brother's wife in order to raise up children for his wife. Onan, however, after beginning sexual intercourse with Tamar, spills his seed on the ground. Okay. So this is not something new. Okay. It doesn't take a whole lot of reflection to understand why one would want to have sex without the consequence of a child. Sex is one of the most thrilling and pleasurable experiences on earth, and having a child, aside from the health risks that are associated with that, is also one of the most challenging experiences on earth. Contraception, no matter what form it takes, withdrawal, barrier methods, sterilization surgeries, or hormonal, contra hormonal contraception taken via the pill, IUD, or injection, all of this seeks to allow for the thrill without the threat. I'll be going, before going any further, it might surprise you to know that the church actually thinks that this can be a reasonable desire. It's a widespread myth that the church teaches sex can only be had for the purpose of procreation. The most recent document of the church on the subject of contraception was written in 1968. It's entitled Humani Vitae. And in that document we read, if, therefore, there are well-grounded reasons for spacing births arising from the physical or psychological condition of husband or wife, or from external circumstances, married people may then take advantage of the natural cycles imminent in the reproductive system and engage in marital intercourse only during those times that are infertile. So the document explicitly approves of what would later be called FABMs or NFP. So if the church taught that sex could only be had for the purpose of procreation, it would not approve of such a strategy. So what is the difference then between contraception and FABMs? So the first thing to note is that intentions are not the only thing that matter in morals. It's possible to have a good intention and carry it out with bad means. Winning the Olympics, this is a good intention. 
carrying it out through steroids, this is a bad means. There's a morally significant difference between exercise and diet and synthetic steroids, right? The same goes for the intention of having sex without having a child. It can be a good intention to want to avoid having a child while having sex. For example, in the circumstance when bringing a child into the world would be a heavy strain on the family. The couple may have the morally good intention of having sex without having a child, but carrying it out through contraception is different in a morally significant way than carrying it out by waiting for the infertile period and the women's menstrual cycle. It's different because the infertility of the contracepted sexual activity is due to the agency of the couple. They made it happen. They took a positive action to make their sexual intercourse infertile. The couple waiting for the infertile period in the woman's menstrual cycle, they did nothing to render their sexual intercourse infertile. For reasons completely beyond their control, sexual intercourse between a husband and a wife is infertile for about 20 to 24 days out of the month. They didn't make their sex infertile. They simply waited for reasons beyond their control for it to be infertile. So I want to give an example and a set of terms that really helped me understand this and see the difference most clearly. So first, the example. It's playing baseball. Okay? Playing baseball inherently includes the desire to win the game. Right? But someone may choose to play baseball for a whole host of other reasons growth and leadership, teamwork, fitness, things like that. It may be the case that someone wants to play baseball for the sake of teamwork, but also wants to lose, let's say for the sake of humility, all right? Now there would be a couple of ways of trying to make that happen. Uh, the team could throw the game and lose on purpose, or the team could play another team that is vastly superior to them, all right? Now, if the team chooses to throw the game and lose on purpose, let's say that they strike out on purpose, they commit errors in the outfield and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, they're not actually playing the game. They're faking it, right? Contraception is like throwing the game. The couple doesn't even really play because they took a positive action to avoid reproduction, which is inherent in the meaning of having sex. Now, recourse to sex during the infertile time in a woman's menstrual cycle is like playing a vastly superior team. The couple really does play. They haven't done anything to make the other team win. For reasons outside of their control, the other team was better. All right. So that's the example. Now let's go to the terms. The terms that really reveal the difference between contraception and FABMs are unitive, non-unitive, and anti-unitive. Right? So let's remember what we have said about sex. Sex consummates romantic love because romantic love is distinguished by this desire to become one flesh, right? union. Sex makes the man and woman fleshy parts of one body seeking reproduction. Sex is unitive. But there are all kinds of very non-controversial reasons why a couple may choose not to have sex. Right? A few examples would include when one of the two is sick, when they happen to be in public, when they are simply tired. Okay? No one blinks an eye at any of these circumstances if the couple doesn't have sex because you don't have to have sex in every single moment that is possible, right? Even though sex is what distinguishes romantic love from all of the other loves. In these situations, the couple did not engage in the consummation of the romantic love through sexual union, so their love is non-unitive. But the couple that contracepts has gone beyond that. They have done something anti-unitive. They have worked against the very activity that makes them to be one body, the very union that romantic love seeks. They faked it. Here again, to summarize perfectly, is humane vitae. 
It cannot be denied that in each case, the married couple, for acceptable reasons, are both perfectly clear in their intention to avoid children and wish to make sure that none will result. But it is equally true that it is exclusively in the former case, this is the case of FABMs, not contraception, that husband and wife are ready to abstain from intercourse during the fertile period as often as for reasonable motives the birth of another child is not desirable. And when the infertile period recurs, they use their married intimacy to express their mutual love and safeguard their fidelity toward one another. In doing this, they certainly give proof of a true and an authentic love. So recourse to FABMs give proof of a true and authentic love, even when romantic love cannot be consummated for good reasons. I mentioned that the terms that really reveal the difference between FABMs and contraception are unitive, non-unitive, and anti-unitive, but you could also use the word love. Love seeks union, right? And this actually hits more to the heart. Everything that matters, matters because of love. Love, as St. Paul says in Romans 13, is the fulfillment of the law. While we can't be loving to everyone at all times, we ought at least choose never to be anti-loving. Right? I may not be able to defend everyone's life, for example, but I ought not to choose murder. Right? I can't defend the life of a person who lives in Australia right now, but I ought never to murder someone. Okay? I was non-loving in this one situation, but this one right here of murder is anti-loving. So, from that point of view, abstinence for the purpose of not conceiving a child may be non-loving from the point of view of romantic love, right? Because romantic love is seeking sexual union, but contraception is actually anti-loving. It's anti-loving from the perspective of romantic love. It warps and it fakes romantic love. It takes away the ability to be one flesh and one body from the couple that is seeking that very one thing and the one activity that can cause it. Now, furthermore, although abstinence for the purpose of not conceiving a child may be non-loving from the point of view of romantic love, it could be the very loving thing to do from the point of view of friendship. Romantic love is distinct from all the other loves because it pursues sexual union, but just because sex is on the table doesn't mean that that couple isn't also friends. And in other words that have been completely captivating for the history of Christianity, no greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends. Abstinence may be the very loving thing to do when one puts aside his or her own sexual preferences for the good of the spouse or for the good of the family. It could be the very loving thing to do. So let's conclude this part of the talk with a summary. All right. The intention to have sex without having kids can be morally good when there are sufficiently grounded reasons, all right? For example, the physical or psychological health of the couple. A good intention is not sufficient for a good act. The means must also be good. Contraception is a bad means because it works against the very union that romantic lovers seek in the one action that can cause it. Recourse to FABMs is a good means because it does no harm to romantic love and it often promotes the sacrificial love of friendship. All right, so we have that summary as well. We're going to move to the next part of the talk, which is going to be more observational in nature. We're gonna be looking at how the pill works and what the, uh, what the consequences of oral contraception have been for women. I'm afraid for the calendar, its days are numbered. Uh. Right. I think that might be one of the worst ones in there, and you'll have to forgive me. Yep, the calendar's days are numbered, and so are the days of a woman's fertility, all right? Now, the pill seeks to make those days even less. So how does it do so? Before looking at exactly how the pill works, we're gonna get a little bit of historical context, okay? So how did the, bill, the pill come about? 1950, Planned Parenthood 
invited an American biologist named Gregory Pincus to create an ideal and harmless form of birth control. Right. As it usually does, research began on animals such as rabbits and mice. And within a few short years, social workers in Puerto Rico were handing out oral tablets to women in the barrio. One witness recalls, women were told this was medicine that would keep them from having children they couldn't support. What these women didn't know is that they were being used as test subjects. During these clinical trials, three women died of complications that arose from taking the drug. As a result, the researchers changed the dosage and continued testing. Now, further studies were conducted in the United States and abroad, and the FDA eventually approved the birth control pill for contraceptive use in 1960. It didn't take very long before safety concerns began to crop up, including the pill's tendency to increase a woman's risk of suffering heart attacks and strokes. By 1970, the FDA initiated efforts to give information about the drug to the women who were using it. As scientists learned more about the harmful chemicals in the pill, they sought to experiment with different levels and types of hormones. So over time, the chemicals in the pill have changed considerably. Today, the pill is still classified as a Group 1 carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer. While women on the pill are less likely to develop endometrial and ovarian cancer, they are more likely to develop breast cancer and cervical cancer. And there's a much higher risk overall for those, um, uh, there's a much higher risk of having breast cancer than the ones that it decreases, all right? Now another, this is really telling, another significant health concern for those on the pill is increased risk for blood clots. Women on the pill are three to four times more likely to develop clot, uh, blood clots, which can lead to heart attack, stroke, and death. Women on the pill are 250% more likely to have heart attacks and strokes than those who are not on the pill. Let me tell you something that's really revealing about this. In the middle of the pandemic, I'm not gonna talk about the morals of the vaccine, okay? Obviously, a lot of these companies didn't care about the morals of the vaccine, but they did care about blood clots, okay? There was a slight increase in likelihood of blood clots due to the AstraZeneca vaccine. Do you remember when that was taken off of the shelf for a little bit? They took the AstraZeneca vaccine off of the shelf because of a very small increase in uh, the risk of blood clots. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and here is a vaccine that might be able to stop it. They take it off the shelves because of the risk of blood clots. There is no pandemic right now, and the increased risk of having a blood clot for women on the pill is astronomically higher than the risk that you would have through this AstraZeneca vaccine. All right? So, now, there's also one more revealing thing that I want to share with you about the background of the pill, and this one is also very revealing for the women, right? It takes two to tango. It takes two to have a baby. What about the man's fertility? All right. There were attempts at engineering a birth control pill for men, but pharmaceutical companies have not gone forward with it for two reasons. One, one of the side effects was a decrease in the size of the man's testicles which was seen as a price that the man would not pay. Two, men are much more likely to sue when they experience harmful side effects. So it's more profitable to market the pill for women. All right. So before talking about how the pill works, let me highlight a little bit of the inequality that is at play here. Excuse me, wrong one. In terms of the rich and the poor, the pill was tested on poor women for the benefit of American pharmaceutical companies. In terms of men and women, most days of the month, women are infertile. Men, on the other hand, are always fertile, and they typically want to have more sex than women. 
It would seem then that the man should be the one to do something about the situation. So what does he do? He engineers a pill that causes the woman to bear the burden of accommodating a desire to have sex without having children. That doesn't seem very liberating to me, except for the man, of course. He's liberated from any responsibility of fulfilling a desire to have sex without having children, while the woman is tied down with all of the adverse health effects, which are considerable. Most women actually who start on the pill stop within the first year because of the unpleasant side effects. In addition to increased risk of blood clots and cancer, which are unexperienced until it's too late, most women quit the pill because they're complaining of these things that happen. Increased irritability, increased propensity to depression, weight gain, and a reduced libido. Now, why does the pill do this to women? Well, the pill makes the woman's body think that she's pregnant. The pill gives the woman hormones that are there in the first couple of months of pregnancy. And as it turns out, a woman in the first couple of months of pregnancy reports feeling irritable, depressed, gaining weight, and having a reduced libido. The difference is women on the pill are in this condition week after week, month after month, year after year. Now, I'm not a woman, obviously, but I'd be willing to bet that there's not a woman in the womb, in the room, that wants, <laughs> excuse me, there are some of those. There's not a woman in the room that wants to take a pill that's going to make her more irritable, more depressed, and gain weight, right? I can assure you, there's very few men in the room that want their wife to have a decreased libido, all right? We may want to have sex without having babies, but generally people don't want to be on the pill. Now that we have looked at the historical context of the pill and highlighted a little bit of the inequality that is at play, let's keep looking at how the pill works. All right. Now, in order to prevent pregnancy, birth control pills employ several mechanisms. First, the synthetic hormones of estrogen and progestin may convince that a woman's body may convince her body that she is pregnant. This would stop the ovaries from releasing an egg. There's no use in releasing an egg if you're already pregnant, all right? So there's no conception at that point. Second mechanism. The pill also makes it difficult for the sperm to reach the egg because the hormone thickens the cervical mucus. Normally on the days uh, of of the month when the woman is fertile, her cervical mucus has microscopic channels, make it easy for the sperm to travel to the egg. The mucus also nourishes the sperm, allowing them to live longer. However, when a woman is infertile, which is the case for the greater part of the month, her cervical mucus looks more like a net or mesh, right? Makes it hard for the sperm to make it up to the egg. And the pill causes the woman's body to produce this type of cervical mucus on a continual basis, right? The other thing that it does It creates changes in the uterus and the fallopian tubes that interfere with the transport of the sperm. All right, third mechanism. Despite the hormone's ability to prevent the release of eggs, despite its ability to um, block the transport of the sperm, sometimes the sperm does make it through and sometimes there is a breakthrough ovulation. Okay, so an egg is released. Now, how often this happens depends upon a lot of factors, such as what type of pill the woman is taking, how consistently she takes it, even how much she weighs. Even with correct and consistent use of the pill, some formulas allow ovulation in around 2% of cycles, while others allow ovulation in 65% of cycles. All right. So, When a woman ovulates, she can become pregnant. However, the pill has another mechanism that can cause an abortion before a woman even knows that she has conceived. Now, I recognize that this is a contested statement, so let me explain exactly what I mean. The third mechanism prevents an already conceived human being from being able to implant in the uterus of a woman. 
which causes the already conceived human being to die. If someone says that that is not abortion, then we're just arguing over semantics, all right? For example, ACOG, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, they define pregnancy as beginning once the embryo has implanted within the woman's uterus, which suggests that an abortion cannot take place until after the embryo has implanted. Since, therefore, this third mechanism of the pill prevents implantation, it's not an abortion, according to those terms. So let me repeat what I mean. The third mechanism of the pill prevents an already conceived human being from being able to implant in the uterus of a woman, which causes that already conceived human being to die. And this can happen in several ways. If a sperm does fertilize the egg, the newly conceived baby, zygote, may be transported more slowly through the fallopian tubes because of how those have been altered by the pill. Thus, the child may not make it to the uterus, where he or she needs to implant and receive nourishment for the next nine months. Because the fallopian tubes are changed, the baby may accidentally implant there, causing an ectopic or tubal pregnancy, which is fatal to the baby and life-threatening to the mother. It's well documented that women who are on the pill are more likely to have an ectopic pregnancy than those who are not. Now, if the baby is able to make it all the way to the uterus, he or she may not be well received. One reason for this is that the chemicals in the pill thin out the lining of a woman's uterus. This is the endometrium. As a result, the baby may not be able to implant. Other times, the child will attach to the uterine wall, but he or she will be unable to survive because the normally thick and healthy uterine wall has shriveled and is unable to nourish a baby. Finally, the pill also affects a woman's progesterone level, and this causes the lining of the uterus to break down and eventually shed as it would in a menstrual cycle, further denying the baby's attempt to implant. All right. So obviously this last mechanism has the most serious consequences. Human life begins at conception. A unique, unrepeatable creature made in the image and likeness of God begins at conception. And God beautifully designed the body of a woman to receive that life in her womb. And the pill makes what should be a home hostile. The final mechanism of the pill does not prevent conception, it aborts an already conceived child. Let me highlight again a little bit of the inequality that's at play here, and this one due to the widespread ignorance of this final mechanism. Unfortunately, this inequality has the most severe consequences for the woman. One medical journal journal declared, if any mechanism of any OC, that's oral contraceptive, violates the morals of any particular woman, the failure of the physician or care provider to disclose this information would effectively eliminate the likelihood that the woman's consent was truly informed and would seriously jeopardize her autonomy. Furthermore, there is a potential for negative psychological impact on women who believe human life begins at fertilization, who have not been given informed consent about OCs, and who later learn of the potential for post-fertilization effects of OCs. The responses to this could include disappointment, anger, guilt, sadness, rage, depression, or sense of having been violated by the provider. Feminist author Jermaine Greer wrote, whether you feel that the creation and wastage of so many embryos is an important issue or not, you must see that the cynical deception of millions of women by selling abortifacients as if they were contraceptives is incompatible with the respect due to women as human beings. The pill has been touted as a great achievement in the advancement of women's liberation, but the circumstances that brought about the pill were inhumane to women. All of the negative side effects of the pill are borne by women 
Despite possibilities for male contraception, because men don't want smaller testicles and women are less likely to fight exploitation and legal litigation, and medical providers do not inform their female patients about a serious consequence of the pill. Contraception is not only contra love, as we saw in the first part of the talk, it is also contra woman. Sadly, there's not really a dad joke that can follow such difficult news. But there is the good news. First, the good news from the gospel, Matthew 23. Jesus criticizes the scribes and the Pharisees who, quote, tie up heavy burdens hard to carry and lay them on people's shoulders, but they will not lift a finger to move them, end quote. Even though the church's teachings on sexuality are motivated by a desire that we have life and have it to the full and joy and completion, as we saw in John 10.10, 10, it can still feel very hard and heavy to carry it out. Humane Vitae clearly stated, each and every marital act must of necessity retain its intrinsic relationship to the procreation of human life. This particular doctrine is based on the inseparable connection established by God, which man on his own initiative may not break, between the unitive significance and the procreative significance, which are both inherent to the marriage act. This teaching is clear, but so is the church's desire to help Christian couples. In the same document, Humani Vitae, the church appealed to scientists and medical professionals to study the natural rhythms of a woman's cycle, to be proficient in this difficult field of medical knowledge in order to help Christian couples have a means for chaste spacing of offspring. And one Catholic physician, who was a med student at the time that this document came out, 1968, heard the appeal and he started doing research. His name is Dr. Thomas Hilgers, and I do want to share that great news. The rotation of the earth really makes my day. Now, Dr. Hilgers, he studied not the rotation of the earth, he studied the rhythm of a woman's cycle, and he eventually developed what is now known as the Creighton Model of Natural Family Planning. I actually got to meet him and I heard a bit of his story when I attended a health convocation, a health conference in St. Louis. Now, before his research, seeking to avoid pregnancy in a way that was consistent with church teaching was very burdensome, all right? The rhythm method had a somewhat, like, like near a 27% failure rate, okay? So as you can imagine, this would cause a very heavy burden on the couple whose circumstances do not allow for another child. His research has immensely relieved that burden. The Creighton model consists in the regular charting of bio biomarkers that women can observe. And they indicate whether a woman is fertile or not. And if you're interested in learning more about this particular FABM, there's going to be resources at the end, and we have plenty here at St. Mary's. All right. There's certainly other models that are available. I'm most familiar with the Creighton model, and I find Dr. Hilger's story particularly inspiring. So I'm going to uh, speak on this one. All right. One result of his research was the development of a method of natural family planning that has the same effectiveness rate as the pill has in terms of avoiding pregnancy, but there have been a lot of other wonderful consequences for women's health as well. Now, Many women are prescribed birth control because of health problems, including heavy periods, painful cramps, endometriosis, ovarian cysts, and PCOS. Now, the problem with pres prescribing birth control for these health problems, uh, aside from the other risks that we have already discussed, is that none of these problems are actually solved by birth control. It's more like ibuprofen than a solution. In every other area of healthcare, physicians seek to give a solution to a health problem. But by and large, the medical community seems content to cover up symptoms of deeper underlying problems that women experience. Now, in some cases, covering up these symptoms can lead to further problems. I'll share one example. A young woman, got on the pill in her teens because of cramps and irregular bleeding. 
Now, eventually, when she got married, she got off the pill in order to get pregnant, but they were unable to achieve a pregnancy. After years of trying, after a year of trying, they found out that she has PCOS, which had gone undetected due to the pill. She had never been treated, never been diagnosed, and that led to her infertility. There are lots of other solutions to cramps and irregular bleeding, but most of the medical community does not use them. It's lazy medicine. Applying the fruits of his research, Dr. Hilgers has developed interventions ranging from bioidentical hormone supplements to surgeries that actually restore a woman's health. So if you have been prescribed birth control for health problems, I highly recommend that you get a second opinion and that you look into these other solutions. We have a great resource here in College Station. Her name is Pam Marvin. She's at St. Joseph. She's a fertility care practitioner. We also have, again, I'll show you these resources at the end. Um, we have the fertility care uh, here at St. Mary's, and I'll give you that website. And they would be able to help you find the resources that you need to achieve genuine health and not just the cover-up of symptoms. Now, before talking about um, some of the other benefits of NFP, I want to reflect a little bit on what the church has provided in terms of health care. All right. We had this philosophical critique of contraception, right? And I believe that it's valid. Contraception is anti-loving. I think it's valid regardless of whether you have the faith or not. But I will also fully admit personally that it is very hard to come to that conclusion without faith. I would have never really been interested in a philosophical critique of contraception if I didn't believe it's my faith that allowed me to see the beauty of the church's teaching on sexuality. Without it, we're, more, we're just more likely to follow the path of least resistance. And the pill is very convenient for trying to have sex without having a baby. But the church demanded more for us. And it has borne fruit not only in the realm of ethics and philosophy, the same faith that caused me to look into the philosophical reasons why we shouldn't take the pill also gave the world the institution of the hospital in the first place. It wasn't until Christ taught love for the poor, compassion for the sick, that men and women of faith began to start hospitals. Of course, since then, there have arisen recently for-profit hospitals that are not motivated by faith at all. But the hospital as an institution has its beginnings in faith. The foremost expert on the early history of hospitals, Gary Ferngren, he made this point very emphatically in a recent historical survey published by Johns Hopkins University. He wrote, the hospital was in origin and conception a distinctively Christian institution rooted in Christian concepts of charity and philanthropy there were no pre-Christian institutions in the ancient world that served the purpose that Christian hospitals were created to serve. None of the provisions for healthcare in classical times resembled hospitals as they developed in the late fourth century. The same faith that brought about hospitals, which has obviously given a huge and immense benefit to the world, is the same faith that caused Dr. Hilgers to make such great advances in women's healthcare. He read Humani Vitae because of his Catholic faith. He researched women's cycles because of the appeal in that document, and women today are able to find real solutions to their health problems that would otherwise be untreated because of the Catholic faith. While interest in his work is to some degree limited to just Catholic circles, it's actually growing in popularity among secular institutions. And with time, the world at large is going to benefit. I believe that we can take pride in our Catholic faith for the fruit that it has borne for women's health in a similar way that we can take pride in our Catholic faith for the institution of the hospital in the first place. The church is not interested in tying up heavy burdens for others to carry. She wants us to have life to the full and joy in completion. She wants us to have these burdens taken away so that we might be able to love as Christ loves. Of course, at times, this includes a demand for things that are not a part of the path of least resistance. 
such as the self-control necessary to have recourse to FABMs, but the fruits are more than worth it. And I want to share with you a few of those fruits. It's commonly reported that there is a lower divorce rate among couples practicing NFP. Lower divorce rates mean lower poverty rates and all of the negative consequences that tend to arrive rise from poverty. This could be for several reasons. First, couples with already strong relationships are likely to be the ones that choose NFP in the first place. NFP requires some of the same virtues that marriage requires. Commitment, communication, consideration, self-control. Couples who reject NFP as too burdensome, too complicated, too restrictive are likely also to reject marriage as too burdensome, too restrictive, too complicated, right? But there could be another reason, and that is that NFP strengthens marital relationships. On the most basic level, spouses are not constantly available to one another in a sexual way, and that keeps them from taking each other for granted. And my friend and his wife, they practice NFP. He is a very virtuous man. I look up to him in a lot of ways. And he recognizes, though, that if it weren't for the built-in periods of abstinence, there would be a very persistent temptation to treat loving actions toward his wife merely as a means to have sex. Right? Another woman reports that while she and her first husband were using contraception, she felt like a toy or a recreational vehicle. The contraception made her husband assume that she was always sexually available and she felt used and taken granted and taken for granted. Since then, she had a conversion. She was married in the church and she's been using NFP for years. And in her words, a chaste marriage is the ultimate. Right? During the times of abstinence, the spouses learn to express love in a non-sexual way. Spouses do not cease to be friends just when sex is on the table. And periods of abstinence provide times to deepen their friendship. And as a result, the emotional intimacy that they share deepens, and that even tends to lead to greater sexual satisfaction as well. Finally, NFP also improves communication in marriage. Why is this? Well, about once a month, somewhere during that seven to 10 day period of abstaining when a couple uh, wants to have sex, especially because she's fertile. And when she's fertile, the man and the woman are more attracted to each other. That's just how it works, all right? They begin to have a conversation as they look at each other. Why did we decide not to have a baby right now? All right. Now, the wife might say, because if we have another baby, I will kill you, all right? <laughs> or she might say, you said that you would do the dishes. You said that you would give the kids baths. You said that you would give me time for shopping on Saturday. When was the last time that you did the dishes or gave the kids a bath or gave me any time on Saturday? And he may respond, I forgot. I'm sorry. I didn't know. I'm on duty. Right? Or the husband might say to his wife, the reason why we're not having any more babies right now is because I just can't imagine how we're going to support these kids that we've already got. I'm worried about paying for braces, tuition, having to buy a bigger van. The way that you spend money. Your friend Jane wants a fence, you have to have a fence. She gets a new kitchen, you need a new kitchen. <laughs> she might reply, I had no idea that you felt that way. Right? I don't need a kitchen. I don't need a fence. Hmm? <laughs> All right. Now, that conversation takes place about once a month for couples <laughs> who are using natural family planning. It makes them assess where they are in respect to these key questions. Why are we having children or why are we not having children? Who's carrying their weight around here and who is not? This is the kind of conversation that marriage counselors want every couple to have, touching base with each other. Natural family planning enables couples to have that conversation. 
Now, the effects of NFP are some of the factors that lead to lower divorce rates. This has an immense benefit for the couple, the children, and society. It's another beautiful expression of that wonderful truth. That God wants nothing from us. He wants everything for us. He came that we might have life to the full and joy in completion, and he loves us too much to let us settle for anything less. Let's begin to conclude this talk with a summary of this section. FABMs and NFP work by charting biomarkers of a woman's cycle and are just as effective at avoiding pregnancy as the pill is without harmful side effects. Now the word biomarkers, that sounds like, I don't know, something really complicated as if this method were really, really difficult to learn. And that actually is one criticism of natural family planning, right? the inability of uneducated women to learn them. But this is simply not true. A large trial in India by the Indian Council of Medical Research Task Force on NFP followed 2,059 women, the majority of whom were illiterate. In this patient population, the typical use unintended pregnancy rate was less than 2%. If you compare that to the pill, the typical use unintended pregnancy rates are about 7%. All right. The World Health Organization conducted a multi-continent study, including many uneducated women, and found that 94% of the women who were taught NFP were able to identify their fertile symptoms correctly on the first cycle. All right. It's not complicated. Their use, NFP and FABMs, has also borne fruit in many other positive ways, health solutions for women and stronger marriages for couples. And we have many reasons to be proud of our Catholic faith. Hospitals and NFP are just a few of them. So I'm going to uh, conclude this talk with some resources, all right? So in terms of your faith, you have here at St. Mary's Pastoral Staff. I want to be honestly very uh, sensitive. This is a very delicate and sensitive um, area for a lot of people. It could be lots of reasons where you may have found yourself on the pill in the past or in the present. Uh, I want you to be able to reach out to St. Mary's pastoral staff here, and they want to be able to walk with you so that you can really receive this in a way that Jesus intended it as good news and have someone to walk with you in this uh, very delicate area of our faith. So aggiecatholic.org. In terms of chastity, there's a wonderful, wonderful website, chastity.com. I got a lot of this research that I've shared with you from Jason Everett, who runs that website, and you can find more uh, research that I didn't share uh, also on that website, as well as great resources for living the beauty of the church's teachings on sexuality. Society of the Wounded Healer. I actually gave this talk because of med students at TU. You have to forgive them, all right? I gave this talk for the first time because they wanted uh, some support in bioethical formation. If you are a medical professional or studying to be one, I highly recommend that you bolster your faith and your community with other medical professionals or those who are studying to be medical professionals, and there's a great link, and we'll be able to get you the slides for this at another time. And you can sign up for uh, input uh, and, for, and for communications at that link, all right? Now, regarding morality, the philosophical argument that I gave you, it comes from this book, One Body, by Alexander Pruss. He is a philosopher at uh, Baylor University. He goes to the Catholic Center there, and it's excellent. Theological would be The Good News About Sex and Marriage by Christopher West. Highly recommend. It's an excellent book. And then a talk that you can find. You can find the full transcript of it, and you can find the, um, the, the uh, MP3 of it online, Contraception, Why Not, by Janet Smith, that fun conversation that I you know, shared about the, the couples and whatnot that comes from Janet Smith. All right. I read this book recently, Adam and Eve After the Pill by Mary Eberstadt. The Social Impact of the Pill, highly recommend. It will uh, open your eyes to some of the social impacts that the pill has had in, our, in the West. All right. Finally, FABMs and Natural Family Planning, you can go to the Aggie Catholic website, aggiecatholic.org slash NFP. You'll find Pam Marvin's information there, as well as the information that St. Mary's is able to provide. It's a great resource. Facts about fertility. This is um, a resource to help you with all of the research 
and all of the scientific background that gives support to the goodness of FABMs and the health risks of other types of family planning, namely contraception. NAPRO technology and Creighton model were also used throughout this presentation, and you can find more about them there. All right? Uh, <laughs> if I can be of help, and I really mean this, if I can be of help, uh, you can find my contact information at austinvocations.com. This is my side hustle, giving controversial talk talks. Uh, my full-time gig is uh, promoting vocations to priesthood and religious life. But honestly, and I really mean it, if I can be of help for you in this area, you can find my uh, contact information at austinvocations.com. Until then, know of my prayers for you. Uh, I'll, I'll hang out a little bit afterwards and, uh, and be able to answer anyone uh, that has any questions or comments. Brother Chris. Let's give it up for Brother Greg.